biomimicry. It literally means copying nature. It seems to be at real odds to much of what, what our culture stands for. We overcome nature. We defy it. We bend it to our will. We build dams, highways, skyscrapers in an attempt to reduce nature to a bit player in our lives. And this has brought us to the brink of the abyss. We're so close we can peer over the edge. Nature now looks to take its revenge, to truly demonstrate who is master. What can we do to pull back? to prevent us from hurtling over the edge. Perhaps we'll hear just the barest suggestion of an idea tonight between our two speakers. Perhaps by listening to nature, using its principles, we can create a more sustainable uh, connections between human communities and the world that envelops us. So it's my intense pleasure to introduce tonight's two speakers. We'll hear first from Nicole Isle, who's the Senior Sustainability Advisor with Brightworks and the firm's campus and urban planning work. Drawing on her experience in watershed ecology and environmental planning, Natalie helps project teams realize a more comprehensive level of sustainability by combining economic, ecological, and systems inter uh, integrated with team creativity, innovation, and collaboration. Um, our next speaker will be Amanda Sturgeon, who's the Certification Director for the Living Building Challenge. She's a licensed architect and has been influential in the sustainable building movement in Seattle for the last 13 years. Prior to joining the Living Building Challenge, she was a senior associate at Perkins Will, where she co-directed the Sustainable Design Initiative across 20 offices worldwide and managed numerous sustainable projects. Um, in 2011, she's a, a fellow uh, of the AI, uh, AIA and AIUSI. I think I got all those vowels in there. Uh, but she, she just got through, she spent a month in Italy studying biophilia and beauty as a pathway to a restorative future. So I think both these speakers will have a, an excellent view of biomimicry, biophilia, and how it connects between design and uh, human social uh, networks. So we'll start with. Nicole, and please give her a hand. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you tonight. It's a pleasure being here to talk to you about biomimicry. I should also say that I'm a uh, trained biologist at the design table, and I studied with Janine Benyus and Dana Baumeister of the Biomimicry Institute. Um, my background is in watershed ecology. I'm a, I'm a biologist, and I spent a number of years um, working in the uh, scientific field, doing a lot of field studies. And so it's been a thrill to take what I know about the biological world and combine it with the work that I do now with architects, engineers, and, and um, the construction industry. So tonight I'm going to talk about the art and science of biomimicry. And biomimicry is capturing the world's attention. It is just gl uh, gaining global recognition. The London Financial Times calls it a growth area for this industry. Harvard Business Review in 2009 called it one of uh, the business world's top 20 ideas. In fact, Janine Benyus, the founder of, uh, of uh, the Biomimicry Guild and Institute and coined the term biomimicry, has been deemed one of the world's most influential designers by Business Week. In fact, the Biomimicry Guild has a close partnership with HOK, one of the largest architecture firms in the world. She's won uh, numerous other awards along with Biomimicry Guild and Institute. She won the Earth Environment Award through the United Nations Environment Program, um, has been on the cover of uh, Time Magazine, and is working with Ash Ashoka Changemakers, um, one of the world's leading organizations of um, social entrepreneurs. It's a global network, and they're taking on some of the biggest challenges in what it takes to design living buildings. You know, what are the big sort of issues that we face in terms of um, en renewable energy production efficiency levels, or the fact that concrete has so, such a high level embodied energy, um, and it's one of the most prevalent construction materials used. These are big challenges that we need to deal with. And so she is helping with the Shoshoka change makers to take on these sort of challenges. So what is biomimicry? Biomimicry is the conscious emulation of life's genius. What does that mean? It means that it's a, it's a learning tool, it's a design discipline, it's a way of thinking about the world, 
it's based on learning from nature and applying what you learn to human challenges. It's not a slavish recreation. It's not post-rationalization of design, calling a spiral staircase um, sort of looking like the spiral of a seashell, for example. It's intentful design where you're thinking about nature, you're learning from it, you're applying what you learn with intent, with recognition to the challenges that you face, whether it's manufacturing or design or um, whether it's um, in uh, organizational development in many different industries. Biomimicry is this great, incredible intersection between um, innovation and sustainability. And really, nature is our best benchmark for sustainability, right? And so if you use nature as a tool in understanding how to build greener buildings and how to organize um, businesses in ways where they're more efficient, more fluid in their operations, we can look to nature because nature has solved a lot of those different challenges. And in doing that and using it as a, as a learning tool and a discipline, you open vast levels of innovation in how you think about the world, how you think about the business that you're in. And really, this is an imperative that we all face because we're limited in the resources that we have available to us. This is an incredible graphic that shows on your left, and the blue ball represents all the water on the planet compared to the sheer volume of it. On your right, the pink ball is all the atmosphere. So all the water, fresh water, salt water in the glaciers, in the atmosphere, captured in that little ball, and in the atmosphere on the, on the right with that pink. So it just shows there are limits and boundaries to the resources that we have and that we need to be efficient with the way that we use them and we can look to nature to learn how to go about living within balance on this planet. Nature has a lot to teach us. Because after all, life has been around for a very long time and human existence is one little blip on that, on that timeline. In fact, over the 3.85 billion years of trial and error that nature has, has undergone in research and development, um, there has been a 99.9% .9 failure rate. And the 0.1% of species that you see today, the 30 million different species, were one of them, have figured out the materials, forms, processes, systems, and strategies needed to sustain themselves in conditions of the earth today. And these are the same conditions that we must face. And so it makes sense to look to nature to understand, okay, how can we live, how can we solve design challenges, for example, in ways that are sustainable, in ways that um, are moving beyond sustainability into regenerative means where we're healing the planet. Nature's figured that out. And we can use nature as a learning tool to solve those challenges. So let's go through a couple case examples. Now, biomimicry really got its start in the late 1990s with Janine Benyus' book, um, Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. And uh, the roots of biomimicry are in product design, but it's expanded into all different professional sectors. So let's go through a couple case studies in product design. Whale power. This is an amazing concept. Dr. Frankie Fish, was interested in how humpback whales are so agile in the water, these massive creatures. Well, what he realized is the leading edge of their fins have these bumps called tubercles. And so he coined this term called tubercle effect. And basically, these tubercles allow for this massive mammal to move through the water and be incredibly agile. And he took that design in nature and he copied it in rotors, in, in, in any type of machine that moves any type of medium, whether it's air, water, steam, oil. And what he found was that there's 32% less drag and 8% increased lift. And in the case of wind turbines, a 20% production increase. So all of a sudden, you have this design that has been in nature for so long, and it was uncovered, brought to our industry in ways that we're making green power is more sustainable on this planet, and all of a sudden you've got a um, alternative energy means that's been struggling to find its place in the market competitive with fossil fuel alternatives. This is a great achievement. 
Um, these wind turbines are being tested on um, Prince Edward Island, and, uh, and we'll see them in production soon in the market. Columbia Forest Products, soy glue. Dr. Kai Chang Lee out of Oregon State University was walking down the beach one day and he was very curious about why mussels, the blue mussel in fact, was able to stick to rocks so well. And Dr. Kai Chang Lee being in the wood uh, forest products research uh, lab at Oregon State, he was looking at you know, different composite wood. So he was dealing with a lot of formaldehyde type products. And he thought, well, if Mussels can do this so well. How can I copy that in wood forest products? You know, what is it that allows them to stick so well in, in, in environments that are so prone to harsh um, element pressures, the constant, um, uh, constant bashing of waves and, and the elements? And so he took the mussels back to the lab. He dissected the protein structure, and he mimicked that protein structure in a soy base. And what he came up with was a glue that um, actually outperformed urea formaldehyde, was more water resistant because it's the protein structure that's used to environments that are more aqueous. And so all of a sudden you have a, a glue where urea formaldehyde, a carcinogen-based glue, has been struggling with in the market for so long. Nature had the answer, a glue that's non-toxic and outperforms formaldehyde. Calera. This is uh, an idea that's out of Los Gatos in California. Um, this company recently won a $20 million grant from Department of Energy. And what they're doing here is they're making green concrete. And they're doing this by actually sequestering carbon dioxide, mimicking a process that's similar to how um, uh, coral reefs form. And so what they're doing is they're taking seawater, they're injecting carbon dioxide into it, and that um, starts the process of forming calcium carbonate. And with calcium carbonate, that is the base substance of um, coral reefs. And so they're making this, this uh, concrete compound. Now what's so amazing here is that all of a sudden you have a concrete, $170 billion concrete industry in the US that is the third or, or fourth largest anthropogenic um, carbon dioxide emitter and all of a sudden you're taking an industry that's such a big polluter and you're turning it to carbon negative. So for every ton of concrete that's created through this process, they're sequestering a half ton. So the World Coal Institute suggests that this product could sequest 70 years of emissions. Um, so this is a very exciting new discovery that has actually been in uh, research for a while and we hope to see it on the open market soon. Uh, a third, uh, third example or fourth example I want to show you is moving from the product industry to the built environment. This is the, the um, two, 200, 300, 60,000 square foot uh, Eastgate Center in Harare, Zimbabwe. And what's interesting about the Eastgate Center is that it is um, mimicked after the way that termites ventilate their mounds. And the way that they do that is through a series of chambers on the outside of the mound. And they're a, they're a distance from the mound, and they spend all day opening and closing these chambers because at the center of the mound is a fungus that the termites feed on. And that fungus must stay at exactly 87 degrees throughout the day and night. When you have temperature fluctuations outside from 35 degrees up to 104 degrees. Um, and so this is like a perfect example, if you're an engineer, of designing in nature to like ASHRAE 55, the equivalent of ASHRAE 55, which is our national uh, thermal comfort standard. And so these termites spend all day opening and closing these chambers to maintain that 87 degree temperature. So that was the um, design that was mimicked in the Eastgate Center, and the Eastgate Center uses no um, mechanical cooling. They have some fans to help exhaust the air, but um, right away the engineer, the owner of the building, saved three and a half million dollars in infrastructure costs and rents in this building are 20 percent below uh, buildings in the surrounding area because of those avoided costs. So what can we, how can we apply biomimicry in our own lives? Well, it's tough to imagine when you live in such a dense urban environment, but really if you 
ease your senses if you put aside your cleverness in your professional field, if you open your eyes up to what nature can teach you all around you, you'll find some amazing discoveries. Because down on the ground, nature is all around you, from the street trees to your backyard trees, to the farmer's market, to wildlife, to recreation, the beautiful parks in the Seattle area. There is opportunity to find new discovery in nature. And that's really what a lot of biomimicry is about, is opening up your awareness and learning about these new, new forms of discovery. So this is my family dog, Willie. And this is Willie on a really good day. And the reason that I want to show a picture of Willie is that you can make amazing discoveries in just the very um, sim simple um, joys of life. And that's exactly what happened with a Swiss engineer, Georges de Maestra, when he discovered Velcro. So he came home from a hunting trip one day, and he was looking at the burrs, inspecting the burrs on his dog's fur, and he noticed the hooks on the burrs. And this was in the early 1940s. And so that's when Velcro was discovered by just the sheer curiosity of an individual that had sort of calmed his cleverness and opened up his curiosity to the natural wonders of the world. Now, Velcro started cotton-based, took a wrong turn, and, and hit uh, nylon and synthetic compounds, so not a true sort of um, biomimetic discovery. You know, there's ways to turn it back around, but I think in the basis, just thinking about nature and what we can learn, this is a really good example. An example that you can find, you know, in your own backyard. So let's look at other examples that you might find in your own backyard and applying it to our lifestyles here at home in a denser urban environment. Love to get out of town, can't always do that. Um, so what can we find in our own backyard? This is a uh, honeycomb and um, Nature does amazing things in that it always follows the path of least resistance and uses as little energy as it possibly can. And so in this pattern, and that's one way you can utilize biomimicry, is in mimicking form, pattern, is that in this honeycomb shape, the hexagon angle of 120 degrees is actually stronger than a 90 degree angle. And also in a repeated pattern like this, you're using less material right, because you're sharing sides in the, in the overall shape. And then also, you've got a round shape with, which maximizes volume to surface area, thus using less material in the overall form. So why is nature going to spend any more energy than it possibly needs to in forming a substance? And it's perfectly forming that substance to the function in which it needs to provide. And so this is an excellent example of mimicking pattern in nature, something that you can find at a city park and maybe not get too close to, but um, nonetheless, an exciting discovery. So another way you can look at biomimicry is in mimicking process. So in looking at um, processes within organisms, across organisms, or in the physical environment. We've learned a lot in, in uh, solar, the solar industry and uh, PV panels and understanding how to collect energy, how to create energy from the sun's rays. And so we've learned a lot about that and I think it's important when you're walking down the street, inspecting you know, the street trees or enjoying your backyard, thinking about all the ways that nature has perfected collecting solar energy. And that can be in thinking about how nature arranges leaves on a tree to optimize the amount of um, solar collection area to create that energy. How to use chlorophyll as a medium instead of, you know, heavy silica-based um, monocrystalline sort of compounds that you find in common uh, photovoltaic panels. There's a company in Australia called Dysol that's actually making a photovoltaic panel based on chlorophyll as a medium, not chlorophyll itself, but a dye that mimics chlorophyll a dye that you can get in a range of different colors, and this dye is a lot easier to manufacture, doesn't take as much water, heavy manufacturing process like silica does, and um, it can easily be injected into a 
glass plate that can be flexible, and so it becomes building integrated. You can use it as a facade, um, and it doesn't have to be a panel that's a separate structure on top of the building. So these are amazing discoveries that we found just from inspecting trees and learning from them, and inspecting plants too, other plants. Like this um, ranunculus here, this is a common buttercup. And from the buttercup and other plant species, we've learned about heliotropic leaves and flowers, how, how flower heads will tend to follow the sun throughout the course of the day. Some plants do it, some plants don't, not all. Um, but the common buttercup does. And so what do we see now? Solar tracking technology that tracks the sun. It's a dish throughout the day that collects energy, optimizes it by facing the dish in the direction of the sun as it travels across the sky. We learn that from, from different plants. Also in leaf flexibility and maximizing solar rays and how the, the light hits the leaves throughout the course of the day. They're flexible to maximize the, um, the leaf area and capture the sun's rays at the correct angle. So lots of things that we've learned from trees and other plants. Here's a third example that you might find um, in your discovery when thinking about biomimetic solutions. And this is more of a metaphorical example, but I think this is a really interesting one. Forest stand dynamics. Uh, in forests, you have gaps in the uh, canopy where there may have been a natural disaster. There may have been um, like a forest fire or a flood, for example. There may have been disease. Um, all kinds of different pressures on the forest stand. They create these gaps. Well, these gaps are, don't represent destruction. They represent opportunity. And the gaps are, can be um, organized in terms of size and shape. Um, abundance, composition, spatial, temporal distribution. And I think the parallel here that I think is very interesting is in urban planning and redevelopment. When we think about downtown urban areas like Seattle and um, the redevelopment of uh, the aqueduct, sorry, the aqueduct, the viaduct and areas of blight here, I was like, you know, reminiscing about my travels to Italy. And, uh, um, <laughs> In thinking about new opportunity in areas of redevelopment, if you characterize them in terms of size and shape, abundance, these different forest dynamics, and saw them as open gaps of opportunity, and at open gaps what happens in forests is that the surrounding needs of the forest can be met in that, in that gap because there are all, there's always change, there's always pressures on the forest, either to bring new diversity in, to add more nutrients to the soil, whatever it may be, and so this new opportunity allows for some wonderful things to happen to build the integrity, the resiliency of that forest stand. And so too, we can take those parallels to build the resiliency and the integrity of our urban areas. So some resources for you to take home. Who's been to the asknature.org website? Okay, several of you have. So, um, as budding biomedics, and maybe some of you have applied biomimicry to your projects or to your um, design processes, whatever, or maybe in teaching others, this is a wonderful tool to take home, and it's free. You can get right on, and you can learn about nature right at the fingertips of your computer. You go to asknature.org. There's a search engine in the upper right-hand corner. You can put in any challenge you face. Um, glare control, thermal regulation, collecting water, um, heat loss, heat gain, whatever it may be. You can put in a common uh, animal's name. You can put in elephant, flamingo, whatever it may be. You don't have to be a biologist. You don't have to put in scientific names. And what this search engine does is that it's linked up to E.O. Wilson's Encyclopedia of Life. E.O. Wilson, the famed entomologist, Harvard professor, naturalist, he's trying to catalog, uh, categorize, catalog the different species on the planet. He's got an incredible undertaking. But all the great work that he's done links right up to Ask Nature. Ask Nature does a query for what you put into that search engine, and you'll get a list of species and the ways that they solve for that very same challenge in all different environments. So these are things that you can apply 
to your profession as an architect and engineer, as a research scientist, as a teacher, as a business leader, whatever it may be. Nature follows two simple main uh, rules to live within the operating conditions of the planet. Those are to adapt and evolve and to create conditions conducive to life. And um, a colleague of mine, Darcy Winslow, has an interesting perspective on sustainability. She says that sustainability is not a challenge, it is a condition to be created. And that puts a very positive spin and puts a lot of hope as to the opportunity that we have in um, how we choose to move forward in um, our impacts on this planet. And I think that biomimicry is one way to go about that. The closer that we're able to align ourselves with nature and reawaken our connections with it, more opportunities we have to move toward a more sustainable pathway. And um, I think Ask Nature is a great way to link into the biomimicry world. So in thinking about your lifestyles, your businesses, the products you produce, the buildings you design, how can they adapt and evolve? How can they create conditions conducive to life? Those are the questions that you can ask. There's a whole series of life's principles around how to go about doing that. It's another sort of piece to biomimicry process that maybe we can get into into the question and answer period. And I'll just leave you with this slide. Each species is a masterpiece, and um, there's a lot of elegance in nature, a lot to be learned. Um, this is a lot of research and development has gone into perfecting the way nature lives successfully on this planet. And so there's a lot to learn so that we can live successfully on the planet in the same con under the same pressures and conditions that these animals have been successful and have figured it out already. So um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Amanda Sturgeon, and she's going to talk about biophilia, the more aesthetic, spiritual side. Well, good evening. Um, I am delighted to be here tonight to talk about biophilic design, and I think the two subjects, biomimicry, that Nicole um, so wonderfully described for you, and biophilic design are wonderful partners um, in our pathway towards reconnecting with nature. Um, so uh, Nicole referred to E.O. Wilson at the end of her presentation, and E.O. Wilson really popularized uh, the term biophilia uh, with his book, Biophilia, here. Um, in the center of the slide. And uh, later he worked with uh, Dr. Stephen Kellett, a Yale professor um, in social ecology, um, who wor they worked together to create the biophilia hypothesis. And then Stephen Kellett has gone on to do a lot of research about how biophilia relates to um, the relationship between people and nature in terms of um, buildings. And a couple of books here. Um, that have been released. Uh, the Biophilic Design Book, a series of essays on biophilic design, uh, just came out a few years ago. And I'll refer to these throughout the presentation, but really the biophilia hypothesis um, is suggesting that there is an instinctive bond between human beings and other living systems. Um, those of you are familiar, I'm sure many of you are, with E.O. Wilson's work, uh, where he talks about how we as a species have been hunter-gatherers for like 99.99% of our human existence on the planet. Um, and he talks about how that informs our um, ability to relate to space and within space. And um, biophilic design is really drawing on some of those concepts um, that are often subconscious to us. Uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, I just returned from a fellowship to Italy where I was studying biophilic design in a tiny little um, southern Tuscan hill town called Civita, um, a fellowship with the Northwest Institute for Architectural and Urban Studies in Italy. Um, and uh, why I wanted to study this subject there is because, uh, you know, this is a town that's um, 3,000 or more uh, years of history. Um, it's built um, on Etruscan uh, structures that are embedded in the rock and has been evolved over time. And uh, there's an incredible connection to place here um, that uh, Stephen Kellett outlines as being, you know, the two sort of pieces of biophilic design, having a connection to our place and also having um, an organic or naturalistic design. And for me, uh, Chivitar and many of the Tuscan hill towns are really um, uh, incredible examples of biophilic design. And so uh, you'll see lots of slides um, throughout of uh, Chivita. 
Um, the differences between biomimicry and biophilic design, how do they build on each other? Um, biomimicry is, it really can be used as a strategy within biophilic design. Um, you know, as Nicole um, mentioned, uh, biomimicry is uh, being inspired by nature to create um, products or um, different elements of a building potentially. Um, biophilia or biophilic design is really looking at the social side of how we as people connect with our place and connect with nature. And, and biophilic design, when the biophilia piece is combined with design, is really referring to buildings. And why is it important? Um, you know, for myself practicing as an architect for um, a long time, it's, um, it's amazing to me that we are surrounded by a lot of buildings that, that lack a sense of place. Um, there's a sense of placelessness to a lot of the buildings that we're creating and building and a lot of the spaces that we spend time in. You know, many of us spend time in windowless offices, um, you know, where we're secluded from the outside world. We don't get to uh, breathe fresh air during the day, hear birds sing, um, or we're very disconnected. And so biophilic design is really trying to create a pathway for us to understand how to uh, connect with our place again. And I think it's important to say that it's not new by any means. Um, you know, we can see here in the Cinque Terre, one of the five little towns um, on the northwest coast of Italy, um, that people have been coexisting with their place for uh, thousands of years in a, in a way that um, is pretty harmonious with the resources that they have, the, the geography, the history, the culture of their place and of, of their um, site. And so, um, you know, another sort of background as to why it's important for us to reconnect with nature. You know, building on E.O. Wilson's um, theories that, you know, we as a species need to interact with nature in order to have a full, loving life. Um, you know, there's been a lot of more work done, and for me it's sort of a, was a horrifying moment when Richard Loof came out with the concept of nature deficit disorder. Obviously not the only person to have written about it, um, but having a couple of children myself to think that children are becoming more and more disconnected from nature. Um, it's pretty scary. And there have been quite a few um, studies and scientific studies that look at the benefits of nature um, in schools when kids have daylight in their spaces, their test scores improve, um, their ability to be creative. Um, improved cognitive function. There's even a study that shows in um, hospitals when you have a view of nature from your window, um, you, can, you will heal faster than if you look out at a brick wall, for example, or have no window at all. Um, and the other, I think, really interesting thing around biophilic design is the neuroaesthetic piece. There's new neuroaesthetic studies happening, particularly in the UK, that are looking what is the commonality between all of us and what we find is beautiful. And so far, the studies are showing us that we all think nature is beautiful. So nature, in some form or another, is beautiful to all of us. It's a common platform or a common language for us to talk about uh, beauty and um, what, what makes us thrive in terms of a spiritual, emotional, mentally health, healthy um, individual or community. So how can we get back to uh, buildings that make us jump for joy? Um, and uh, I know my kids always jump for joy when we go out to Shai Shai Beach <laughs> once a year. And this is a picture a friend took of my son jumping for joy. Um, you know, how can we feel like this when we're in our buildings? You know, what will it take for us to feel like this? Um, <laughs> I would love to see is that someone that's been the designer of buildings, I would love to see us all feel like that when we go into spaces. I just, I just want to be inside because we're spending most of our time inside. We should feel like this way this way when we go inside spaces. Um, you know, Stephen Kellett has made a really good uh, attempt at trying to, and there's various versions of this, at trying to uh, classify what we mean by biophilic design and what the elements are that would um, make a building connect with place and have its naturalistic um, forms. And he came up with six different design elements um, that I'll go through in a little bit more detail with some visuals to. Um, illustrate uh, what he means by these. But um, environmental features, um, natural shapes and forms, natural patterns and processes, light and space, place-based relationships, and evolved human nature relationships. And I think the evolved human nature relationships particularly sort of builds on some of E.O. Wilson's work about us as this hunter-gatherer sort of 
make up needing um, prospect and refuge, for example. You know, I think all of you have been in a restaurant where it's busy and full and the only tables left are in the middle of the room, right? We're all sort of lined up around the edge with our backs to the wall, um, allowing us to see out. Uh, we want to want to understand what's, what's um, in front of us and be able to have some preparation for that. So um, environmental features, and these are, these are parts that uh, we're all familiar with, to be able to have views and vistas, um, to be able to have sunlight, have a relationship with natural materials, and, and you know, we really see this in Civita and in many of the old Italian um, Tuscan hill towns where people were really building with, with what they had, with the earth beneath them. Um, but also, you know, there was a sense, a, a deeper connection with that prospect and refuge, and that often you were building towns that were somewhat defensive to the enemy, <laughs> and you wanted to be able to have, you know, vistas and views around you in order to make sure that you weren't being invaded or attacked at certain times. Um, but, you know, a really great example of some of the features that... Um, come up with an environmental features and how we're connected with, with our materials and nature. And uh, it's been, you know, Stephen Kell's talked about direct and indirect relationships to nature and relationships to place. And direct being, you know, when we're immersed in nature, we're, we're taking a hike in the forest, for example. A lot of the relationships to nature that we have within buildings tend to be indirect. So they tend to be about, you know, the use of materials, the ability to see out, um, or ability to have sunlight, uh, connection with water or animals, for example. Um, a couple more examples of environmental features. Um, <coughs> you know, bringing water into a building. Uh, I've also seen some studies recently that looked at the benefits of having some kind of water sound or some kind of water relationship in healthcare projects and how it can really help people to heal faster. Um, also, you know, the use of really natural materials here and this, um, you know, image to the left where we really let nature just sort of overtake our buildings. Um, the second category is... Uh, talking about natural shapes and forms. So this is the Eden Project um, in the UK, in Cornwall, that uh, really did use, actually, biomimicry. It's a really great example of how biomimicry, I think, and biophilic design really intersect. And there's actually a great TED talk by the, uh, by the architect of this building. If you um, look it up and you look up Eden Project, um, you'll see it. But they looked at, at what nature would do to cover a space like this. This is basically a greenhouse botanical space and uh, came up with the concept of a bubble. Um, what would nature do to, to cover a space like this? And so each of those little cells is actually a, a bubble. It's inflated to some extent. Um, it's a two-layer uh, plastic. And so I think it's an example of where biomimicry has been used to create elements of a building that then really celebrates and, and tries to rediscover a place. This was an old mine that um, was uh, rejuvenated. And, um, you know, again, the use of natural forms in a way that makes a lot of sense from a biophilic design perspective. Each of these little pop-ups is allowing the sun to be tracked through the day and allowing sunlight uh, throughout the space. So they all face in, in a different direction and you're able to track the sun inside the space as it moves through the day, um, allowing us to connect with um, the time of day and the weather outside. Um, natural patterns and processes is the other category, and, and it includes things such as the patina, allowing the patina of time and age to inform our buildings. You know, in Chivita, there were several earthquakes, one every five years or so for about 100 years, between the 1750s and 1850s. Um, and many, much of the town actually dropped away into the valley, and ruins are still visible on the side of buildings. Um, you know, my sense is, is that if this was in the U.S., that would all have been cleared away and demolished by now. <laughs> but um, being able to be connected with that story and that history of this place is a really important part of, of who the community is here. There aren't many people left living in Chivita, but um, allowing those stories to be told is something I think we can really learn from as we're building in this culture. Um, the other part of natural patterns and processes is allowing the connection between inside and outside um, to be celebrated. And how can we blur those spaces so that we can be sheltered from um, sun, uh, we can be sheltered from the weather, but we can still be immersed in nature and be partly outside. And it depends on the climate, of course, but relating to what your climate is. 
Light and Space, this is a project actually one of the first uh, certified living building challenge projects that um, the Omega Center in upstate New York, um, where they really did allow sunlight to come in the project, um, but also, you know, balanced it in the backside with sort of this diffuse daylight. So there's lots of different patterns of light that happen in this space. When you're there at different times, you see the sun moving through the room, um, and it, it connects you with the outside in a very direct way. And then I think um, you know, one of the oldest examples of, uh, of architecture, the Pantheon, where the entire space is lit by this, this opening at the top of the building, um, open to the sky. And it's just the most powerful demonstration of light of a space that I have ever been into. Um, I think really reminds us of how we can be using light as a, as a key way to connect ourselves back to nature. So how can we develop place-based relationships also? Um, you know, the connection to place is one of the key things of biophilic design. And you know, just the roofs in, um, in Italy where uh, the layers and the patterns uh, are related to um, the craftsmanship and the culture and what can be made locally and what can be transported um, really start to connect you to, um, to a detail of the place that can only really happen in that particular place and is very hard to replicate. And a more local example, um, Islandwood, the treehouse, um, I think gives kids an amazing opportunity to be connected to the outside, but be partially inside, um, and also to, to sort of relate to being in the trees or in the canopy to some degree. Um, the last uh, grouping I wanted to talk about of biophilic design is the evolved human nature relationships. And uh, this is the Sagrada Familia by uh, Gaudi in Barcelona. Um, which really does replicate and, and imitate um, natural forms in order to create a spiritual uh, experience. And probably the most spiritual building I have ever been into, which is not a church or a place of worship, is the Sydney Opera House. Um, and, uh, you know, Jorn Utzen, the architect here, decided what, um, realized what it would be like to, to transition people through a space from the main harbor or bay, uh, Circular Quay on Sydney Harbor, um, you gradually transcend a series of steps until suddenly you find yourself inside the building and that pathway continues all the way along the side of the, um, of the opera and the symphony halls to the point at which you get where you're in, to the end and you're, you're just subjected to this amazing view of Sydney Harbour. Um, I think it's an amazing example of not just a natural form, um, whether you, know, you find that appealing or you don't, but also an understanding of how you relate people to a place. And a, a quote that I really like by Jornitsen, um, light God's eldest daughter is a principal beauty in a building. Um, I think it's, uh, it's something that we've lost sight of as a group of architects and designers, unfortunately, that, that would be easy um, for us to find again. So I just want to talk a little bit about how does all of that in biophilic design relate to the, the work that I do as a certification director of Living Building Challenge. And uh, within the Living Building Challenge, which is 20 requirements to um, move us towards a restorative future, and we have more information on the tables there, and I can certainly talk to you more about the program. Um, but we require, one of our requirements is that uh, designers address biophilia um, in those categories that I outlined and um, not in a way that they've designed their building or their neighborhood, and then they've told us, you know, well, this relates to nature or this relates to nature, um, but in a way that, that changes their design process and how they may have designed the project in the first place. So the Living Building Challenge really does take uh, from nature its inspiration. Um, how can we design buildings that uh, really act like a flower? Uh, they're pollution-free. Um, they harvest all their own energy and water, but they're also beautiful. And uh, I think that question of what is beautiful um, really does come back to the commonality between all of us, which is uh, nature. And I'll end on a quote um, by Stephen Kellett, uh, that the values of biophilia require we seek to harmonize nature with humanity if we're to achieve a just, secure, sustainable, fulfilling, and loving future. And, um, you know, biophilia means love of life, and uh, I think, you know, a biophilic design really takes a love or a caring of a place and a, and a uh, culture and a history in order to, to be realized. And with that, I'll finish, and I think we're going to move to questions. 
the question I kind of have is, uh, are we still developing complex buildings where we may not know how everything really fits together until you make it and then find out that it's not actually quite as efficient as you expected by adding up each of the pieces? Well, like I mentioned in um, my presentation, nature takes the path of least resistance. It doesn't use any more energy than it absolutely has to um, in creating the materials that it uses. Um, one of the simple laws of nature is that it uses simple common building blocks. Nature's materials are formed from hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, plentiful materials, um, not uh, bromine, mercury, lead, arsenic, silica, materials that we like to use that um, that aren't as plentiful, that are more uh, rare earth elements. Um, and so I think in building, there's a parallel there in using simplicity in design, using plentiful materials, um, using simple shapes that can be repeated. Um, and I don't think we're quite there in our building today. I think in buildings that um, are highly flexible spaces that are modular, that really tailor to the re building relationships with the interior occupants and allowing them to do their daily activities and not feel hindered, I think is an important aspect of, of um, green building. And I think those are things that we can learn in nature. So I think I'd have to say that it's, you know, Thinking about simplicity and design, um, plentiful materials is important in building. So you're actually you're actually saying if you use biomimicry, you probably actually are simplifying our processes. Whereas today we seem to be making things more complex with our standard processes. So it would be a simple, with our, it would be a simplification, and therefore it would be quite as big of a problem. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the big uh, green building best practices is multifunctional design. And nature is a master of that. If you think about like a mallard duck you might see at a park nearby, um, when a duck cleans its feathers, it's preening. Well, when it's preening, it's also moisturizing the, um, it's also um, putting a uh, moisture layer on the, on waterproofing the feathers. And it's also at the same time moisturizing its beak. And in the presence of sunlight, the, um, uh, lotion that it uses to waterproof and moisturize the beak turns to vitamin D. So it becomes a nutrient for the duck. And so in the one simple process of cleaning its feathers, it's performing four functions. That's multifunctional design. And again, that's nature's way of using as little energy as possible to do as many different functions. Well, that, and that gets back into kind of bio, biophilia. Um, uh, when you show the dome, often, a biophilic design, like a dome. We actually, it looks really pretty. Uh, and there's a lot of good structural engineering aspects for having a dome structure. It includes, it includes a great amount of space on a very small surface area, things like that. But because of the curved, curvature nature of the building, uh, it's very hard to make uh, mass market furniture uh, using industrial age assembly lines to create the, the heating and cooling systems that they might need in different structures with different curvatures. So, is there a way to incorporate the biophilic design of a building like that and still maintain some of the efficiencies, or does it have inherent efficiencies that, that beat a lot of our, our modern uh, square structure? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think many of the structures that we have, like I showed the one of the sort of classic big box uh, store of some kind um, at the beginning of my presentation. and. Um, you know, the reason I think we have a lot of projects, uh, buildings like that, where we don't really know where we are. We could be in a Home Depot in Seattle, we could be in a Home Depot in Atlanta, right? We don't, th there's really no connection to place. Is really because we want to make building something that is, you know, we can commodify and we can replicate and, and make cheap and reasonable um, in terms of a cost perspective. And I think biophilic design is really calling for um, a movement away from that where we actually are looking at each place and what's appropriate to each place. So where there may be a dome appropriate in one place and function, um, it may not 
that may not be appropriate in the next place. And so it doesn't mean, I don't think, that things can't be replicated, um, but I think it's calling for a much more careful examination of what's appropriate in each place rather than simply repeating a pattern no matter where it is in the world. So actually, this is one of the questions from the audience, is the idea of feng shui um, as a way of placing a structure inside of its surroundings. Is, is that a large part of, of biophilia or an aspect of biophilia that could be uh, applied to a, a much larger uh, global uh, uh, culture than just in the kind of bits and pieces you see? Yeah, I mean, I think I see biophilia personally as being a movement very similar to what we've seen with food, where we're seeing, you know, the 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 um, rise, rising or increase of slow food, or local food, or organically grown food. Um, I think we really need to begin that movement with our buildings, where we have you know, slow buildings, <laughs> and we have buildings that are local, and we have buildings where you know, those that have created them have really sat and listened and watched and um, taken account of, of what's in that place. And so, yeah, I think, uh, you know, if we build with biophilic design, the buildings would have quite a lot of feng shui in terms of, you know, their character and connection to their place. Um, you know, and I see it as a movement that's sort of similar to the other movements we're seeing, where people are really trying to get a grasp more of their local community, their local culture, and be more rooted within it. Um, and I think biophilic design speaks to that. Well, one of the things I, I like both of you to, to kind of talk about this is uh, both of these ideas, biomimicry, biophilia, require uh, a lot more thinking. What are some of the ways to make it easier to have that time to think, but still meet the pressures from uh, the economic pressures that are out there? Mm -hmm. Well, biomimicry is a design discipline that's best served you know, at the very upfront portions of a project where you're doing some pre preliminary planning and thinking about how you're going to frame the approach on the project. Um, and thinking about what you're going to design and how that's going to impact the place. I think um, when you start to consider cost issues, budget constraint, you know, budget constraints and costs, when you start thinking about time constraints, when you start thinking about the um, goals and desires of the client and their own constraints from investors, you know, that can co definitely complicate the process. But I think that it can also bring great resolution and clarity to design when you start to think about ap applying biomimicry not as a technical cumbersome design process, but in a thought process that takes you through the whole sort of um, approach to how you're going to carry things forward from the sensitivities of the site. Um, to elements that should be preserved, elements that um, should be restored, and how does that then feed into the massing, stacking, the orientation, the size and shape of the building on that site. And then also just in thinking about nature's design principles around how nature has succeeded so well on this planet. And those are elements um, that parallel with biophilia in terms of being locally attuned and responsive. Um, you know, you see in, uh, in the mountains, you don't, rabbits don't have big ears that stick up into the sky, but in the desert, they surely do because they need a massive amount of surface area to exhaust heat quickly. And so um, that's an example of being locally tuned and responsive. And also in the example I, I talked about in multifunctional design, um, I think that's a really good approach to building in efficiencies in design if you can think about what is the true function of this building? What, who am I serving? How are occupants going to, um, how are they going to behave in this building? Um, how does it sort of connect with the surrounding community and design for those true functions? And in those functions, you can use then life's principles um, to then apply a more efficient, streamlined design. So I think it's this upfront thinking and just sort of making a commitment to thinking about things in a different way. And I think that biomimicry just helps to direct the team in a way that's very focused instead of sort of general green building practices where there may be a checklist or just sort of a, an a la carte menu that you choose from, 
that are all great things to do, but they may not be best for the building. A tremendous amount of the buildings that we have now and the, the way they've developed, we have almost 100 years of experience on putting those together, what the codes need to be. Uh, organizations, communities feel much more comfortable with those sorts of buildings because there's a tremendous amount of experience that goes into their construction. So uh, a lot of what I think, you know, biophilia and biomimical I have to deal with is overcoming that uh, fear, uh, providing time for the community to, to contemplate it and actually uh, move forward. So uh, part of what would be interesting to hear is if, if you have an, an idea of, of have there been community successes that move through those processes and overcome some of the things that might slow down. Um, yes, I think for sure. I mean, I don't know that doing um, a building with biophilic design necessarily um, slows down a process as much as uh, simplifies it and causes us to consider what's really valuable. Um, and I think biophilic design really speaks as much about ethics, love, morals, <laughs> as anything and that it really questions our greed as a human race <laughs> and our need to do things fast and for the most profit possible and um, I think it draws a deeper ethic um, out of us uh, when we have to really consider our place and respect for our place and our culture and our history so um, you know there's been many communities I think that have stopped and said okay how are we going to build a place that's important for this community that speaks to this community. Um, you know, one of the Living Building Challenge registered projects is a, is a cob house that uh, the owners built um, by hand themselves, and they had to challenge lots of building codes. Um, they uh, pretty much broke all of them. They had to make friends with the building inspector. You know, they had to connect a flush toilet, and then, you know, as soon as they got there, um, occupancy certificate, take it out, and then put their composting toilets in. I mean, they're pretty creative. And, and what I'm seeing with people that are choosing to do the Living Building Challenge, for example, and that's not the only pathway necessarily, but, um, you know, is that people get pretty darn determined to do this stuff. They will not let anything get in their way. And um, what I've seen more and more with Living Building Challenge is people just being so excited that there's a framework um, that can help move them towards um, not just biophilic design, but you know a truly restorative future. And uh, people will, will get around the rules. They'll work out a way to do it. Um, I think we're pretty creative <laughs> in that way as a species. That's a great point. <laughs>